and then E is for eyes on the prize because in terms of their motivation, that's something we get asked about a lot. And it's, it's down to what's in it for them. Like, what's the point? Are you working for grades on a bit of paper? No. Do you actually care about grades on a bit of paper? No. But do you care if that gets you into the, the program that then lets you do coding for the game company that you really want to work for? Yes. Yes, you do. Do you care if that opens the door to the university that you're really, really, really desperate to go to? Yeah. So we, we talk the kids through first, figuring out what they want to do with their lives. And I mean, I don't know about you, trying to think 10 years into the future, it's a bit tricky, particularly yep. given the last couple of years and how turbulent everything's been. What you could do though is 10 years in the future, if I sent you off to right move now and said, pick three houses, you'd be happy if you were living there in 10 years. That you could do, that we could all do. But for a teenager, if you do that and you're looking on the rental tab, so you know roughly what your monthly payments are going to be from that you can work out what would my salary need to be to be able to afford to live there. Welcome to the Prime Life Project Podcast, a place to help you unlock your full potential, both mentally and physically, to become the best version of you. Welcome back to an episode of the Prime Life Project Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel James. And today I've got not one guest, but I have two guests with me today. And again, this is going to be one for parents out there, but not just parents, also for uh, kids that are going through their GCSE years as well. So it can be a particularly tough time uh, for both the parents and the kids. Uh, and I've got two experts here to actually help you guys today, help you guys navigate through it. So if you take any value from today's episode, don't forget to like and share it with a friend. With a friend, Help us to spread the word to help as many people as possible. So today my guests are Emily and Paul Hughes. And they're here to give you tools to support your child during the GCSE years without stress and drama so they can get the best results they possibly can. They've had over 30 years of teaching experience between them and the teenagers of their own make them the perfect team to help you. They've coached over a hundred, sorry, they've coached hundreds of teenagers, not just pass their exams, but also develop the kind of skills that will set them up for the next challenges that they face. Paul and Emily, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks Hello. for having us. Oh, no, you're very, very welcome. I'm really looking forward to this. It's, it's not a subject that I'm very well versed in because I'm 32 years old. Uh, it's been a long time since I've done my GCSEs. However, I do public speak in schools and it's normally year 10s and year 11s that I talk with. So I, I know these kids well, but I don't have specific experience in it for a long time. So can you just take my audience back to like, how did you guys actually get into this space? Because it's quite a unique thing to get into. Uh, and again, when you guys reached out, I was a bit taken back by what this actually was. So can you just talk to me about what got you into this space in the first place? Uh, well, yeah, so we are both ex-teachers. We, uh, we met because we started on the same day in the same school and uh, everything kind of happened from there. But we got to the point, I think I was 15 years in when um, my mental health took a bit of a bit of a wobble and I decided that my sanity was more important than my salary mm -hmm. so I needed something that I could take my skills from teaching and put them to good use but outside the classroom because the classroom just wasn't wasn't going to support me anymore in the way that I, I needed a job to so so yeah we went through various different what can we do's and finally, we had this light bulb moment when, um, so our, our daughter was in, I think, year five or something at the time. There was a parent on the Facebook group who jumped on and went, oh, they've got this homework, is bar modelling for maths. How on earth do I help her with it? I've got no clue. And that's totally fair, because bar modelling is something that we've, um, we've taken from, I think, Singapore. We never did it when we were at school. We've been trained in it as, as a maths teacher. I, I know how it works, but as a parent it might as well be in Greek like it makes no sense mm. and I suddenly thought you know there's all this stuff out there supporting kids there's revision guides there's tutors there's YouTube channels there's all sorts there's nothing for parents mm. and there's nothing more frustrating as a parent than watching your child struggle with something and not being able to help them mm. and that's where the idea came from we did a bit of research we couldn't find anyone obvious at all that was that was doing this that was supporting parents through this journey because what your kid needs is a mentor to help you sail through the exams without any stress rather than what you sometimes get which is a drill sergeant and <laughs> um, you know we say knowledge beats nagging all of the time and uh, if we can show parents how they can properly support because if you've not done it for years we don't know mm. the way we used to study is very different than the way we know works now 
absolutely so it's it's a real challenge for parents and we wanted to be there to support parents through all of this it turned out to be perfect timing because we started september 2019 we were seven months in when they cancelled exams and then there were all <laughs> the other dramas and so we were able to support parents with all of the the uncertainties that happened through certainly the early stages mm-hmm. of the pandemic with you know, how are they going to do teacher assess grades and so on so it was very much right place right time clearly meant to be were you both math teachers <laughs> oh i wish no i'm not that clever <laughs> no I, I was an it teacher Oh, you've been taking studies. Don't offend IT teachers. Well, okay, yeah. Sorry if you're out there. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Uh, I Emily's a maths nerd. She she loves it, and the maths teachers are a very um, special breed. Special breed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true. Uh, Paul was in charge of the yeah, so he was head of ICT, which then became uh, computer science and things yeah. like that, and um, business studies, childcare and development, um, health and social care, and my favourite, they put him in charge of. Hair and beauty. Mm-hmm. Oh. Well, uh, it's a good job that I warned you that we were going on a video today, Paul, as well, because you've clearly done your hair for it as well. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, 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 I, I was the perfect, perfect person for that job role, I was told. I, I love yeah. that. Um, so can I just because again, I wasn't quite sure about this, um, Emily, about your mental health. What specifically was it is that just the stress of what you teachers are put under? Because I think uh, I've I've had a few teachers on the podcast before and I think you may agree with me on this. I think fundamentally the educational system is broken uh, at its core. And I yeah. think, I'm, I'm glad you agree on that. So we can, we can agree. It's fun, it, yeah. Yes, yeah. Un, understatement of the year. Um, so was that what fundamentally caused everything to sort of wobble and then your mental health take a bit of a, a tumble? Because fundamentally you guys get into teaching for the right reasons. You actually want to make a difference and you actually care. But then once you get into it, it's a bit like, what on earth is this? Like that's, that, well, that's a consensus I've got. So is that kind of what led to you struggling a little bit? ish although not really I'd recently taken on my first head of department role so I was head of maths and I was loving it it was a really challenging school and I really enjoyed it (laughs) really enjoyed it I was line managing my old key stage three maths teacher from when I was at school and my (laughs) a-level teacher from when I was at school and it was weird but but I loved it and then my line manager changed and um, my new line manager was not so fun as my old line manager. And um, yeah, it just got to the point where I was driving to work crying every day. <laughs> I really shouldn't be doing this anymore, I don't think. So uh, it was then Christmas holidays. Uh, and as a teacher, so any teacher will tell you, particularly at the end of the holidays, you start to get the, the back to school nightmares. A night, two nights before you go back, it's the, you know, you've been put in charge of a class and you have to teach them biology, but you have to teach it in Latin. Or <laughs> you're in charge of a school trip and half the class have gone missing or um, something. I was having those from the start of the holidays and I was miserable. And Paul said, look, if it's making you feel like this, mm. then really you need to just take a step back, like mm. take a bit of time off. Mm. And um, so I didn't go back that first week of January. And I think that my brain at that point went, oh, good, we can stop coping and just broke. Mm, yeah. so, I, I mean, to be clear, it, it was about workplace bullying. It was, you know, mm. that, that was the reason. Yeah. A bad boss kind of makes it sound like they maybe didn't know what they were doing, but it was actually, you know, picking on, trying to make your life miserable, sending you the emails on Boxing Day on the 27th of December saying, I need X, Y, and Z on my desk on, on the morning of January the 2nd, and it can't be any, it just really strange things to do to, to try and get the best out of an employee. So, yeah, education's broken, but teaching is fabulous mm. if you teach in a brilliant school yeah. mm. if you've got a supportive team around mm. you and a, a senior leadership team who who cherish their teachers yeah. teaching is great it's, it's probably brilliant in fact yeah. um but it, if you go to a bad school or have a bad boss um it, the challenges are huge yeah no, that's, something that, that's something i noticed when i went to some of the different schools i go into because i specifically want to work in underprivileged schools but obviously got different levels of underprivileged so i remember once i had to go in and talk to a business class about business uh, and as soon as i was walking in with this teacher she turned around to me and said just so you know i'm not a business teacher i'm a spanish teacher and i know nothing about business and i was just thought wow so that nightmare about teaching class in latin that's that was yeah. essentially yeah. her job it was a reality she was having to yeah. teach a, some, a subject she has nothing like, no knowledge about and I just thought, wow, like imagine getting up every single day and doing something you have no idea about, you're not specialised in, and you've studied to do a subject, and you've now got a job 
that you thought you were going to do that. I just thought, wow, like, no wonder, like they said, the education system's broken mm. because what kind of passion is she going to be able to, or not even necessarily passion, what kind of knowledge, knowledge yeah. are you going to be able to actually, part, part, like, gee, there's nothing there. She'll be working yeah. literally one lesson ahead of where the kids are just to make sure yeah. she, she's got just about enough to blag it. And, and blagging is not what teaching's about. No, it's teaching's not what you're about, going to do. You know, knowledge and imparting it, not making it up mm. and hoping the kids don't spot it. Yeah. Mm. So okay. where do you, where, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Well, it's just, it's staff shortages nowadays. We've even pre pandemic, um, certainly experienced teachers were leaving the classroom in droves because it's just become more and more miserable to do as you've gone along the, the red tape, the paperwork, the, um, the disdain from the department for education. It's just got harder and harder. And so there's lots of inexperienced teachers and now there's also all of the the COVID absence of teachers when they're ill and things and it, it's just crazy I was running a department with I think I had two PE teachers who'd been drafted in to teach the maths um <laughs> that's, yeah. that, 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 that's making me nervous you're just saying that's making me nervous thinking me times to go and teach some maths I won't have a clue it's it's fairly standard it's um because um PE teachers it, it's a bit more flexible flexible and and you can get away with doing less PE lessons just about but you can't get away with doing less maths lessons that's where they get drafted from mm-hmm. for maths for science mm-hmm. it's painful so what, I got so roped into doing PSHE so I was having to teach like sex education and things to year eight which was I think probably you need to be a specialist for you know <laughs> but, but this, this is the thing you can see though as a, as a, as a kid because again I go back to when I was um, doing sex education at school you can tell when the teacher is uncomfortable and then you just thrive on it because you're there oh, like yeah. this teacher's so uncomfortable. And again, same with maths, same with whatever, whatever it is. Like, so even if like you bring in a P teacher in to teach maths, they're clearly not going to be teaching the top maths group. They're going to be teaching the lower maths group. So then you've got kids that are struggling. They then see the teacher struggling. You then see the teacher isn't comfortable. It's a breeding ground for the teacher to essentially get bullied by the kids and the kids just run absolute havoc. And it's interesting. I don't think that many uh, parents listening to this will actually understand how bad the schooling system is like because it's, it's only through me actually working in schools this last year that I've actually realized how bad it really is so apart from the teaching like shortages and stuff like that what when it comes to the actual curriculum do you think there's a massive issue with the actual curriculum and what the kids are taught as well I think in terms of what is now available is a huge issue. If you think about my department, uh, business, if we go with just business studies and IT, and ignore the the hair and beauty for the moment. <laughs> um, when when I first when we first started working at this school together in two thousand and four, the business studies department probably had eight members of staff, give or take in it. The IT department had five members of staff. Um, when I left, there was basically one IT teacher and one part time business studies teacher. Wow. So. If you are a student who, who wants to do computing or IT or business studies, there's slightly more vocational topics, they're not really available. There's either nobody to teach them or schools just simply don't offer them. It's all about you must do maths, you must do English, you must be good at history. And for a lot of kids, that doesn't work. It's not what they're good at. Um, so, yeah. It's they're a- cutting back as well. So we know a couple of dance teachers, for example, who've been told you either have to teach most of your timetable in one of the you know academic Mm -hmm. subjects or we're gonna have to let you go because we're not putting on the dance classes anymore Mm -hmm. and as a kid that would have devastated me (laughs) dance class was my favorite place in the whole world as a kid and shaped a lot of who I am today because of all the the opportunities that gave me the extracurricular stuff teachers are being gradually squashed out of the vocational things and it means those kids who um, who just they're not academic and that's fine because that's not what they want to do we're, we're renovating at the moment and I was having a chat with various of the, the builders especially the younger ones and they were just saying they were miserable at school mm-hmm. because they're very they're physical they need to move around they want to be active they want to be doing stuff and if you're an active kid or a fidgety kid you're doomed at school because oh, no, you, you've you know, got you've got ADHD Oh, mm. yeah. it's like it's like do you have ADHD or you're just being so completely suppressed exactly because they as a teacher it's really hard to manage in terms of the classroom absolutely if you're a really confident teacher and you're very capable and experienced then you would be fine with having a couple of kids who need to move around a little bit at the back that's fine you know where to put them so they've got that space however if somebody from Ofsted or even your senior leadership team come in and they see a kid wandering around the room, that's immediately, you can't manage your class 
and you're in trouble and they're starting to check in on you regularly and make you miserable it's it's not something that is that you can do in school you can't encourage those kids and and it's really frustrating to watch you see some clearly really talented kids you know your artists and your musicians just slowly dying in the corner of the the lesson because it's it's just not where they want to be it's not what they need there are there are basics there are fundamentals but to insist that every single child knows how to solve simultaneous equations before they leave school is stupid. And it's one of those things. Where, uh, teacher, uh, and I don't use simultaneous equations. But, but this, 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 yes. this one thing's when it comes to uh, like maths yeah. and stuff like that. Like I really struggle with maths. Like and again, when I was at school, get plenty of guys at school. They were like, "Oh, you're never going to have a, a calculator walking around with you." And obviously now you've got a phone, you've got Google, it can do the maths for you. But for me, they're missing out on fundamental things. For example, IT. Like everything now is done on tablets. Like you've now got kids that are literally, they know more about tablets and computers. They want to be computer games designers. They want to be coders. There's a kid that I know, he's nine years old. He wants to be a coder. And he was telling me about my MacBook and what, and I was like, mate, how on earth do you know so much about my MacBook? Like, I didn't even know about that. And again, the, the, you they got, don't have the teachers available to teach that. And then you've got maths, for example. One of the biggest things that people struggle with is understanding interest rates, inflation, how to actually manage money, which again is basic maths. It is maths, but you're not taught that. You're told the square root of something or Pythagoras' theorem. <laughs> And it's like, what relevance has that got to anything? And I love what you've said about the, the creativity of, of skids. I'm not sure if I've said this story on the podcast before or not, but I was in a specific school and I was doing a, a big, it was in a, an assembly hall, had 20 kids. Now, at these 20 kids, this is the same teacher where I said, she's a business teacher, but she's actually a Spanish teacher. And she got given 20 kids, 15 of them were boys, and they were the worst 15 boys in the school. Okay, so they'd figured out that she was a Spanish teacher. So they were actually uh, being sexually inappropriate to her in Spanish. There was five girls in the class. The girls were crying and basically they all got sent to the principal's office. So I had this class, this, this, this hall of kids. Luckily I had the space. I made them sit one gap, one gap, one gap. And there's just one kid at the end and he was just misbehaving the whole time. So uh, he said something, I called him out on it, made a bit of a joke about it. sort of made a bit of an example of him kind of thing. And then it got to one of the, the activities where I had to get them to draw something on a piece of paper. And instantly I thought, ah, what are they going to lean on? But I thought they can figure it out. Of all the kids, there's 20 kids, this one kid, this troublesome kid, turned the chair around in front of him and then draw on that chair. And I turned around and said, you're a genius. I said, the reason why you're playing up is because school's not designed for you. But I said, of everyone in this room, everyone had the opportunity to do that. And you were the only one that actually did. I said, you're a genius and I would hire you. And honestly, you should see him look on his face because no one ever told that to him. The reason why he's misbehaving is because he's clearly a creative kid. He's, his brain is clearly very entrepreneurial. He's clearly a problem solver. And you're forcing him to do English, maths, history that he clearly doesn't care about. But mm -hmm. you should see him look on his face because I couldn't believe it. I was like, that is genius. Like, I wouldn't have even thought about that. So again, I think that's a real key thing there with these kids. Mm -hmm. They're just so pigeonholed. And I can't imagine the frustration they must feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's tough to watch. I mean, you get to the point where, you know, you, you are confident enough as a teacher. You get to know the kids and you, you get given the challenging groups because they know you can deal with them. And the best way to do it is to try and get to know the kids a little bit because when you get them, when you understand where they're coming from, you can create things that work for them and, and will engage them a little bit better. But that's still really, really, really tough to do. I think... One of the best lessons I ever did with my bottom set year eights who, bless them, hated maths. <laughs> um, but, you know, they, they were lovely kids, really, but they were also the naughty kids because, you know, yep. they felt stupid <laughs> all day long. Why wouldn't you misbehave? Yep. Um, and I got just got masking tape and taped all sorts of random lines over the desk. And then we did angle measuring on the desk and they had to draw on the desk label all the angles and things with um with like dry white pens because it rubs off the desks they were like what we get to we get to draw on the desks yes yes you do yeah. <gasps> I loved it. the most work i ever got out of them honestly yeah. because it was different and it was creative but it took so much time in setting up i couldn't do that because yeah. of the workload mm. couldn't do that more than once a week tops because it's exhausting yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's um, and that's before we, get, we haven't even started talking about workloads and marking <laughs> and preparation, and which is why we love doing what we do now. It's just so nice to be out of that 
Yeah. Um, but it has given us a, a, an even better understanding of the pressures that teachers are still in the system or under. So. Absolutely. So let's, let's actually talk about what you guys do now then. So uh, what would you say uh, is the biggest struggle that you see from kids when it comes to actually revising for their GCSEs? Because obviously you've had experience while in the classroom, but obviously now doing what you do now, what is the actual struggle that kids have when it comes to studying? Because I used to hate studying. Again, I'm a very creative person. I was, I'm, I'm, I'm dyslexic. Uh, I really struggled at school. So when it came to revision, I absolutely hated it. The only subject I ever revised for was history because the teacher told me I'd never amount to anything. And I was like, I'm going to show you. I've got this really cool interactive CD-ROM. Do you remember the CD-ROM things? And it was basically an interactive computer game to teach me about history. And I loved it. But that was it. Apart from that, I hated it. So what is the biggest struggle you sort of see with kids when it comes to actually revising? They, well, they don't, they they don't know how. <laughs> School, it's simple. Schools are great at teaching content. They're great at, you know, generally great at teaching content, as long as it's not a biology, sorry, a Spanish teacher teaching business studies. <laughs> but um, it, it's about, you know, what is what does good revision look like? Yeah, um, and, and in order to take, say, year 11 and teach them revision skills in general, that is something that usually you have to take them out of timetable to do you to bring in a maybe a guest speaker or somebody has to plan an entire day or half day around it so they're all out of lessons for half a day you've got someone who has to plan it or you have to pay someone to come in how many schools do you think manage all of that stuff because of the timetable pressures because of the funding pressures very few we asked parents recently actually and it was horrifying 85 percent of parents said they didn't feel like school had taught their child how to revise 85 mm. percent and that's not necessarily the figure. Teenagers aren't always great at telling their parents what they've been doing at school, but it, it fits with our experience. Mm. It's, it, it's a, a challenging thing. And if you don't know how to learn, you don't have a teacher in front of you when you're at home revising saying, do this and then fill in this thing and then checking it for you. So if you haven't been taught how to revise, you do what, what we probably did when we were doing our GCSEs, which is you sit and you read through the textbook or you read through your notes, or you maybe highlight some stuff. Hmm. And those are hands down the worst ways hmm. to revise. Or, or worse still, um, you know, parent may hmm. say, right, you've got to go upstairs and do some revision. So you kind of trudge up there. You sit at your desk and well, I don't really know what to do. If you don't want to know what to do, you, you know, everyone will just sit there and procrastinate. They'll they'll tidy the desk, they will all sort out their pens, they will you know, if you know what you're doing and how to do it, you'll go and crack on. But if you're sitting there thinking, more often than not procrastination yeah. will be the thing that happens yeah. first for a good half an hour before you actually get anything done whatsoever so it's, a lot of what we do is yeah what does good revision look like yeah. and what do, what does it look like because i don't know this and it's, you, you hit a really good point there uh, Emily, about the um uh, learning how do you learn because there's yeah. two different conversations here like how do you actually learn and that's something i've only recently really um understood like people learn in different ways not just necessarily like uh, visual learners or auditory learners but actually how they learn is like in the state you've got to be in to learn so then then you've got that and then you've also got how to revise so there's two different things so let's go with how you learn first and then let's loop back into what does good revision look like because that's obviously the key thing here but let's talk about how you can actually learn so what are the different ways and what's the what is the best way of learning for people different times styles to learn it very much as you said it does depend on the person um in terms of if you're a a, a very languagey person then talking it through is the way to do it having that conversation explaining it to someone else if you can explain it to someone else so they can understand it mm. you know you understand it yeah. I think it was an Einstein quote. If you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. Yeah. And so if you're quite languagey, that's the way to do it. If you're a very visual person, then mind maps are probably a great way to go. I've recently switched to doing those as my to-do lists rather than having a list list, because that way I can pick out what's important. What's the thing I have to do right now, rather than my brain telling me I have to work my way through the list from top yeah. to bottom. So, um, so yeah, there's, if you're if you're more of a, a listener, if you remember all of the song lyrics ever, and um, if you're not so great with the reading things because of say dyslexia, maybe making yourself audio notes. We were interviewing a former student actually for our podcast, and he was saying that for English literature, he and some friends acted out scenes from the text that they were doing. And wow. um, I think it was a Shakespeare thing. So they were acting out and doing silly voices and so on. But they remembered that stuff. They remembered the quotes because they'd done it 
in in an auditory fashion and then they could listen back to it yeah they recorded it and they yeah. just listened to it on the bus or on the uh, walk oh. to school or yeah. and, and the silly voices are the things they remembered but because they were silly voices they knew what the words were yeah, yeah. so yeah. one of the best ways to think about it as a as a student but also as an adult i guess is the last thing that you like really that you learned that you can still really so in fact not the last thing something that you've learned that you really clearly remember how did you learn it think back to that like we did a training session and um, you wouldn't have been there that was a different school but we did a training session on spaced learning and we were learning about Lithuania and we learned stuff like you know the capital and details about the different foods and things like that and because of the way that they taught it which was a spaced learning thing they teach you it they make you do something entirely different and probably physical I think we were trying to juggle or something for 10 minutes then you come back to it and you go through it again go away and do something different a bit of origami I believe then we came back and we had to fill in the blanks and we could answer nearly all the questions because that was a really good way of learning for a lot of us I still remember that hmm. so spaced learning is something that I know works really really well for me that's really and interesting if you've got something that you learned, if you've been on a, a training course for something and somebody explains something in, in a particular way, if you did an activity and it really worked for you, odds are that's a good way of you learning. Because mm. that's something I just recently learned because I always thought as a visual person for dyslexia, so like I need to sort of see things. Uh, but it turns out because I listen to so many podcasts, when I did this test, I'm actually now an audio person. So mm -hmm. my biggest thing is actually when I hear things, I retain a lot of information through audio when actually I thought it was more visual, but it turns out it's, it's a mm -hmm. lot more auditory, which I thought was fascinating. Uh, so Paul, can we go back to looping around then about what does good revision actually look like? Because again, that's obviously fundamentally what you guys sort of do now is the revision. So uh, again, most people have no idea how to revise. I know that I didn't. When you said about like just reading through a book, that is literally me still to this day. So if I have to revise for something, I'm there and I'm reading through the book, I'm like highlighting things, I'm looking at my notes. That's, that's me still to this day at 32 years old. So what does good revision actually look like? Uh, it, well, we talk about active and passive or active versus, pa versus passive. Uh, if you're actively revising where your brain is having to do something, it's having to um, take the information in and process it and maybe sort of rewrite it or uh, make a diagram or a mind map, whatever, that is the best way of revising. If, if you're passively reading through a book, you've got your 400 highlighters out and you're kind of blindly kind of just colouring in the entire page because it looks like you're doing something, <laughs> yeah. nothing goes in or the very mm. little goes in. So it's all about the, the active um, sort of side of things. So an example I would give, and I always enjoyed this when I was teaching, is if you make a note about something uh, to do with the lesson, whatever it is, Spanish, and you, you write a word on a, on a post-it note and you stick it on the wall, but on the back of that post-it note are all the different tenses, the different verbs, whatever it is to do with that particular word. Stick it on the wall. And, and if you know by looking at that word, what's on the back of the, the post-it note, you, you, you know it, that's fine. It goes on the wall of champions. It goes on the, I've got this. But if, it, if you don't know what's on the back of that, you've actually got to walk over to that post note and look on the back. And that active kind of uh, action of having to turn it over really annoys me, students, whoever. And but because you have to turn it over, you, you, you're kind of rereading it. And then you put it back on there. And the next time you go to it, you're probably going to remember it because you've had to go over and it really annoyed you the first time. So it's kind of gone in that little bit more. And eventually that will also move over to the Wall of Champions. You know your stuff. So it's all about having a system where you can create uh, resources of things you don't know. But eventually by them sitting there in front of you, you will transfer them to where, you know, either in your brain or on the wall, you do know that stuff. It will be able to recall it in, a, in an exam readily and easily. And again, that's just one, one technique. There's a bajillion more. Yeah, testing yourself is a brilliant way to do it. And um, even if you don't know the answers, the act of testing yourself, trying to do quiz questions or past papers, um, because it makes your memory try and work for it, it does the trick. It's um, it's telling your brain this is important information. I need to be able to remember this, even if I can't quite get it yet. Your brain then knows to kind of work through and try and try and process it. So, um, testing yourself in in any way is great. I quite like my favourite is taking a mind map or something visual that you created, study it for a minute or two, turn it over, try and recreate it on a blank bit of paper, or better yet. If you can do it on a tablet because you've got a little kind of pen thing, yep. then you're not wasting lots of trees. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and you can color code things. Yeah, hi- yeah, highlight it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Recreate as much as you can without looking at it again. When you get stuck, take a peek. Mm-hmm. Keep going yeah. until you've done it. And you should find that the more often you come back and do that, you know, once a, you do it after an hour, do it after a day, do it after a week, do it after a month. By that point, mm-hmm. you can pretty much guarantee it's in your long term memory. Mm-hmm. And it's quite fun. Like you set yourself the little challenge of I'm going to get further than I got last time. Last time I only got three of the branches. This time mm. I'm going to get four. And so you turn it yeah. into a little yeah. game. And it's the frustration of not being able to remember yeah. what the blue branch was or whatever that particular aspect was. It really annoys you. And because it annoys you, your brain wants to know. It's desperate to know. Oh, mm. oh, I, yeah, of course. And then the next time you come to do it, it's that blue branch or whatever that fact was that the thing that goes down on the mind map or on whatever revision um, resource it was that'll go on first because it's absolutely yeah. absolutely there this time because the thing that upset you last time i was going to say that it's normally the uh, oh there's a really good quote about like uh, it's the questions you don't know the answers to are the ones you need to ask or something like that like i just understand the the the, the in my exams, it would always be the one that I struggled with the most would be the one that I remembered because it annoyed me so much. It's like, you have to close that loop. Like you have to close it and you have to know the answer. And because you didn't know it and you've actively gone out of your way to know it, like that in the exam, you'll, you'll read the question. You're like, oh yeah, I, I know this one because you've actively done the, the, the thing for it, which is fascinating. Can I just ask a random question that popped into my head? Because obviously we're talking about mind maps and color stuff. Do you find that typically men struggle more than women when it comes to revision because obviously women are quite creative like they've got the colors and the diaries and the journals and they're quite like they are quite creative creatures and again academic wise like from what i remember at school like women kind of loved it the guys were kind of a bit troublesome and stuff like that is that something i've completely made up or is it something you do tend to see that guys tend to struggle more than girls uh, I, well yes they do full stop um <laughs> <laughs> you know women are just um it just better i think because they mature certainly at school yeah, because they mature uh, uh, quicker yeah so i asked our 13 year old daughter about her top set maths and uh, she's talking about boys misbehaving and all and she gets really frustrated when people get in the way of her learning which obviously <laughs> was a parent. Um, but within that group of 25 30 students there are only five boys in there uh, and and that set is determined purely on data purely on test scores and what have you so um girls are better at school um certainly earlier on it yeah. is it is very much maturity thing. the maturity thing so um in terms of sorry, brain boys. development sorry we're mm-hmm. you know, brief bit in neuroscience I'll, mm-hmm. I'll keep it light i promise um your your brain develops kind of back to front so the back part of your brain the reptilian you know fight or flight kind of you know seeking excitement kind of part of your brain um, that bit develops first and then gradually it gets to the prefrontal cortex which is the sensible bit so I tend to describe it as um, like you're kind of you know when you've got the, the really stupid drunk friend who's like yeah let's go and get kebabs at two in the morning at the dodgy place that gave you food poisoning last time or the one who wants to you know drunk text their ex or things like that then you've got the the designated driver at the front who's the person who goes no that's let's just go home let's do the sensible things let's let's not try and do whatever it is so where as they're developing girls develop their brains faster than boys Mm -hmm. and so for boys for a lot longer basically it's like their their drunk friends in vegas are running the show there is no designated driver there's no one being sensible about it so they're busy doing all the the risk taking and the stuff that seems like a good idea at the time and is fun and and the girls are making more rational decisions because their brain is just better developed for doing that earlier so the boys do catch up eventually yeah but it is it's physiology it's it's the science of their brains and so when your teenager is doing ridiculous things and you're like why on earth would you make that decision Hmm. that's why because there's no one sensible running the show at the moment so they do grow out of it Hmm. and it's not just you (laughs) although i'm 51 and you say i've still got some work to do it's not quite on the that is true i i'm glad i asked that question because i said something that popped into my head especially when you talk about the mind maps and stuff so i remember at school i can very vividly remember like seeing some of the girls and they had all these colorful markers and pens and i'd be like well, that's stupid. Clearly wasn't stupid. It clearly worked really, really well. So I'm glad that I actually asked that question. Uh, when it comes to like good revision as well, um, do you recommend having a, a, a set sort of timetable? So they 
the kids kind of know where the where they're meant to be and what they're meant to study and is there a set period of time that you recommend kids revise for because i know for me if you give me an hour to do anything more often than not i'm gonna get bored so what i've actually started to do when i'm doing any sort of work is i'll work for 30 minutes rest for five minutes and i'll go for 30 minutes again and people will say well how can you work because i will literally work all day sometimes at 8 p.m mm -hmm. and i feel fine because let's go 35 35 35 so is that something that, that you teach the, the kids or how do you recommend that well, yeah a, rev a revision plan is really important but if you think about how much time is available to any student after school so school finishes let's say four o'clock uh they go to bed at 10 o'clock that's a huge chunk of time if, if they're lucky yeah well, yeah yeah right i was i was being that's the point where you're asleep yeah. so you can't check yeah. them anymore but yeah so it, yeah with that huge chunk of time there's no way any student alive is going to spend all that time revising um, but what students will always kick off about is the fact if you say, right, you must revise and therefore you can't go and see your mates, see your girlfriend, see your boyfriend, uh, whatever the situation, go to the cinema. If you say you can't do this, you know, the, the, the shutters go down. And so essentially, as long as they plan in the things that they want to do, the things, you know, the, the, the life they have, the, the friends they have, plan those in around your vision there should still be plenty of time for those revision blocks during your after school yeah. hours yeah. so it, it shouldn't be that they can't play football they can't go and do their sports club just make sure that the, the uh, revision blocks fit in around what they want to do with their kind of after school kind of relaxing activities mental health is huge Absolutely. look after that first do the revision second yeah so I mean, uh, there's a lot to be said for a routine and doing the same thing at the same time every day because it just makes it a no-brainer, which means they don't have to think about it so much. However, um, as Paul said, if they plan in the non-negotiables first, so if they know they can't possibly revise at you know, nine o'clock on a Thursday night or whatever it is because Love Island's on and they can't cope with missing it, not that I know <laughs> anyone <laughs> feel like that. So unfair and accurate, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Just rolling my eyes for those of you <laughs> listening. Um, but if you tell them that, then that if it comes down to that choice, which are they going to pick? Um, not revision. So um, so we get them to, we, we made a revision plan generator. One of the things we first did when we first started the business was, well, this is the big thing. Everyone needs to know how to make a revision plan. So we'll start with a video on how to make a revision plan. We tried all the tools we could find. And oh my word, it was painful. Hmm. Paul got really cross with it because every time he'd go back to try and edit something, it'd just delete all his previous stuff and he'd be starting again. And he was getting, it's getting quite angry. Getting <laughs> so we decided we, you know, we can do better than we this. We can do better than this. There must be a better way. So we got our web guy to build us the revision plan generator. So you put in your subjects and your term dates and press generate a plan and it will randomly generate you a plan for the whole of the year up to your exams um, our default in terms of timings is one half hour block a day in that first term so up to christmas in year 11 yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. two half hour blocks a day in the second term three in the third term which kind of balances out against the amount of homework that they have they'll have lots of new learning in at the start of the year much less revision and the other way around by the end of the year so half hour blocks is what we advise and then it adds it all up at the end as well so you get a summary at the end that says you'll have done 39 and a half hours worth of maths which means mm. they can see that that little and often really really adds up because that's the other powerful thing if you're staring down the barrel of like the whole of the easter holidays chained to a desk while everyone else is out in the sunshine because you've not done your revision that's pretty painful if you do half an hour a day five days a week that adds up to an extra um, something crazy like two school days worth of learning a month that it's has blown my mind by the way Do you know what i'm thinking about this i'm literally it's bizarre when i talk to teachers it's like i it's almost like therapy for me and it's very traumatic because i go back to when i was at school i'm just thinking of when i was revised for my gcse i think i was like trying to force myself to do two or three hours of revision but again it's because i hadn't done anything up until like the two months before my gcse's i was yeah. like oh but i need to i need to revise and there's no way i could do anything because you're trying to digest maths and then you try and digest english and then history there's no way you can do that all at the same time but when you guys are like yeah just 30 minutes a day i don't think any kid out there would say they can't do 30 minutes a day well they'll try but, but, <laughs> but, but, but i mean as a compromise yeah. i think that, that's that is so more than achievable especially if you're saying you can still go play football you can still go see your friends you can still do all this stuff but just 30 minutes a day you can do it whenever you need to do it but just get it done i think that's absolutely incredible and the fact you said at the end it shows you how many hours you've actually done that in and of itself is like 
wow, like, cause you can see it add up and that's what people love. Like when I do my meditation app, it tells me how many hours I meditated for. And I'm like, that's all what well, I've meditated for like four days. Like awesome. Like it just makes you feel so good about yourself. Yeah. Indeed. Um, so if you're listening and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I need that because mm. I was thinking I was going to have to do it on Excel or like leave my child alone for three days with four Sharpies, three highlighters and two tons of glitter to make their own. It's uh, parentguidetogcse.com. And then if you look under services, revision planner, it's all free. You have to sign up for an account because then it keeps it under your login. Um, but the, the free version will create you a basic oh, plan. The revision plan is free. Uh, yep. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Is amazing. It? There's a paid version as well, which is part of our GCSE toolkit, which lets you do stuff like prioritize subjects and decide where you're going to have blocks at the weekend and, and stuff along those lines. So it just gives you that bit more um, uh, the ability to tweak it to your child a little bit more. To Amazing. Their needs. We'll get, we'll get, and, we'll, and, okay, and you can okay. save more than one child's plan as well. So if you've got more than one child doing revision for different exams, you know, one in year 11, one in year 13 you can save them both on the same thing so uh, we're going to go into the uh, the toolkit at the end because i want to like actually deep dive into what people actually get for this toolkit so i really want to actually deep dive into that because uh, again it's very very reasonably priced as well so i want people to actually deep dive into that uh, and again all the links we put at the bottom of the screen as well um so again on youtube uh, mikey will just ping them across so you can actually check that out and get that for free um so before we actually link into this toolbox thing so if we spoke about the frustration for kids uh, what do you think the biggest frustrations and concerns are from the parents uh, when it comes to the revision stuff because i think we sort of touched on it a little bit at the start uh, about like parents haven't done it for years maybe they feel a bit stupid um and do you also think the parents put a lot of unnecessary pressure on the kids which then also causes a bit of an issue as well sometimes i think <clears throat> kids tend to come in two different varieties and it is there's a spectrum but generally speaking you've either got the the kid who is actually like they care they're working they're trying but they're clearly putting too much pressure on themselves and maybe you are as well but you're worried about them getting overwhelmed you're worried about their stress levels or you've got the kid who is so laid back they're horizontal and they don't appear to give a monkeys and they won't do anything and and usually they fall somewhere in between until you get to that last minute panic phase where mm -hmm. it's um, oh my gosh I've really got to do something and maybe they get mock results back and then they start panicking which is usually that was me that work. was me that was me yeah <laughs> and that's what mocks are designed to do yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah so it's it's somewhere in between so there are parents I think mm -hmm. who put unnecessary pressure on their kids but I was going to say at the same time teachers mm -hmm. uh, sorry parents how long do they actually get to spend with their child's teacher over the course of year seven to year 11? Parents evenings are generally five minutes. It's possibly the most pointless five minutes because you get, oh yeah, they're well behaved. They sit next to little Johnny. Um, <laughs> this week we're doing whatever. It, it, there's yeah. nothing in there that really helps that parent to assist their teenager to be better at that subject. It really is I, I, yeah, as a teacher and as a parent, I've never really seen the value because it is just so short. It's, um, you know, so I think what we like to think that we do for our members is we, we kind of fill in that extra sort of the, the, the gap where you have only got five minutes. They can have as much time with us as they want to yeah. ask, um, you know, how best to revise what needs to be done, how much time, in what order. Um, yeah, one of our members said it's like having a teacher in your pocket. I think it's one of the biggest things you see like I said you've got the two specialists of kids and I think you've got um again from the parents point of view like when you've got the kids that are really overdoing it on the revision I feel like there has to have been some sort of pressure put on them by either a parent or a teacher do you know what I mean because I don't believe any kid would willingly want to push themselves to that point of view and again when I'm working with adults I know that uh, again that I literally work with people up to, to 60 70 years old when you break back some of the issues and problems they've had a lot of it stems back to childhood a lot of it stems back to like the, the, the school time and again i think a lot of it nowadays you, you see some of the, the parents they are so they want the kid to do so well that they put so much pressure on that kid to do well that again the kid either does one two things either crumble and completely resent it like, i'm not doing it or they're like oh my god I, my, my parents only love me if i get a's and if i don't get a's then they're going to kick me out of the house and i'm unlovable and i'm a failure and da, da, da. And it's like it's such a negative thing so do you teach anything about um this could be a bizarre question but do you teach anything about communication between parents and kids 
A little, yeah. We, we talk a lot about mindset in general. Um, so things like, I actually got to hear Carol Dweck talk about mindset and growth mindset and things and the, the idea of praising the effort rather than the outcome. Mm-hmm. So it's not about, wow, you got an A. It's, I'm so proud of how uh, how well you worked towards doing that that kind of thing so you're you're praising the effort that they're putting in rather than it all being about how will how well did you do you know did you win or did you not win that kind of thing and it's um it's a tricky one it's something we talk about quite a lot as as parents ask us the questions um because it is it's difficult i don't think parents i think there are very few parents who do it deliberately agreed it would actively be saying you need to do really really well in this it's really important Mm -hmm. you know you're going to be a doctor or whatever therefore you need these grades blah 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 um but as a parent it's just really tricky there's no handbook which is really annoying and there's no support either Mm -hmm. when they're little you've got your nct groups and your mums and toddlers and your all all the little things there's groups online for you there's all sorts of people going okay so my child has just taken their first steps at this point is that normal my child's struggling with this when they get to teenagers everyone seems to assume that you know what you're doing and you don't (laughs) we're still making it up as we go along that's how it works and it's it's really frustrating because it's tricky you fall into bad habits with the kids and you find yourself nagging because you, know, you don't know what else to do which is why our, our motto is knowledge beats nagging if you know what they should be doing if you know that putting too much pressure on themselves and doing trying to do three hours a night of revision is going to actually harm them because you can't absorb that much information it's just going to make you stressed and tired you're not going to be taking it all in properly much better to take some time for yourself that kind of thing i think that supports parents in in having those conversations and making uh, making that clear with their kids as as they go along yeah mm-hmm. i think it's not a bit oh, sorry sorry come paul carry on well i was just going to say if, uh, if, if as a parent you do take them a cup of tea whilst they're revising and they're sitting there with the books open and they've got the market uh, the uh, highlighters out again that knowledge about that's probably not the most mm-hmm. effective way it, it, it leads to conversations you know, because if they can work smarter not harder most children their ears prick up at that point thinking well there's a better way of doing this work you know, I know that there's always that slight barrier about my parents know nothing, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm not. I'm, I pref- absolutely refuse to listen to anything that my parents say because they're stupid. Um, there's, there is always that slight barrier, but, but that's um, kind of that's what we do. Yeah. We um, we call it our B two stealth system because what you want to do is you want to take like small but really important nuggets of knowledge, deliver it to exactly the right place at exactly the right time, much like a stealth bomber, but without anyone seeing it coming and having time to put the defenses up. Yep. So if if teenagers are watching our one of our videos about something with their parents, then you're coming at it together from the yep. same point of view. You're on the same team. It's not a battle anymore. And you're seeing from the same hymn sheet. And that that's quite powerful because then, you know, as a teenager, it's advice coming from experts, not mum and dad thinking they know everything and so it's much harder to write off but also parents can be learning alongside their child about stuff like how to learn and watching watching your parents learn something new is actually a really important lesson almost for your kids that you don't stop learning when you leave school and you're not doing exams anymore Mm. you're learning forever and that's why it's good at, and good to get so, good at it yeah. and for Carry the record on. i think our teenager impressions are pretty good yeah <laughs> <laughs> we've got three in the house at the moment so uh, you know but we'll uh, you, can, you, you can play it back to them and you can say how are our teenage voices and you can okay. take lessons from them i think that you've hit on two key points there that i want to, to touch on uh, the first one is about parenting and the fact of there's no manual for it again i'm not a parent uh, but again i've had uh, some podcasts about uh, with, with um uh, people coming on about how to basically essentially be the best parent you can be and it fundamentally is working on yourself first mm-hmm. i don't mean like it starts with yourself so if you are noticing you're getting snappy and stuff like that with your kid it's like just turn the finger back on yourself and ask yourself like maybe it's not the kid that's doing something wrong like maybe you're stressed or worried on your over whatever it is work on yourself first and then it becomes actually easy to parent so that's the first bit of advice and the second thing as well we said about uh, again saying to a kid about working smart or not harder again any kid if you could say to them listen would you like to have 30 minutes extra playing on the Xbox or PlayStation? Well, they're going to say yes. Okay, well, here you go. Here's how you can actually narrow down this one hour of revision to 30 minutes. As you said, their ears will completely prick up. They're like, well, I can do this in 30 minutes, not an hour. Yeah, 
wow, okay, well, I'll take that all day long. Like, I mean, it's, an, it's an absolute no-brainer. So I think that's, that's, that's absolutely amazing. So let's now loop it back into um, this uh, GTSE toolkit that you guys have got. Can you talk to me about like the, the steps of how this actually works and what is so special and different about this versus what else is out there? I, I know you said there wasn't much out there. So but what actually is this and um, what makes it so special? The, the toolkit is something that we put together for students. So mostly the, the way we started was we were a membership for parents giving them advice. But what parents were saying to us was, what I'd really like is a package where I can give this to my child and they can go, oh, great. I'll set up a plan. I'll get myself organized. I'll know how to study. That would be brilliant. So that's what we put together. And we use our, we call it the GCSE system. And um, so G is for getting organized, like making a plan for your time, making a plan for your notes so that you can find everything when you need it, because that's absolutely key. C is then for content, getting everything covered. And um, S is for your study skills, making sure that you know how to learn. And then E is for eyes on the prize, because in terms of their motivation, that's something we get asked about a lot. And it's, it's down to what's in it for them. Like, what's the point? Are you working for grades on a bit of paper? No. Do you actually care about grades on a bit of paper? No. But do you care if that gets you into the, the program that then lets you do coding for the game company that you really want to work for? Yes. Yes, you do. Do you care if that opens the door to the university that you're really, really, really desperate to go to? Yeah. So we, we talk kids through first, figuring out what they want to do with their lives and I mean I don't know about you trying to think 10 years into the future it's a bit tricky particularly yep. given the last couple of years and how turbulent everything's been what you could do though is 10 years in the future if I sent you off to right move now and said pick three houses you'd be happy if you were living there in 10 years that you could do that we could all do but for a teenager if you do that and you're looking on the rental tab so you know roughly what your monthly payments are going to be from that you can work out what would my salary need to be to be able to afford to live there, which then opens up a few ideas. And then we go, well, okay, what if you won that amount of money every year for the rest of your life? So you don't need to work. What would you do with your time? Like how, how would you spend your days? Because what do you love doing? What are you great at doing? And then we go, now figure out how can you get someone to pay you to do that? Because that's the key thing. And I haven't found anything yet, apart from sleeping, that you can't get a job in. So like jobs that involve eating, yep, restaurant critic, food taster for the queen, I don't care, there are plenty. Um, food blogger, there's all sorts. Shopping, procurement is massive. It's a huge industry, you can shop for a living. Social media, obviously, bajillions of jobs nowadays, because it's huge. If they can start to see that there's something exciting that they could actually be working towards. And then they start looking at the steps as well, because if they don't know what steps it needs to get there, like what qualifications, do I have to get a degree? Do I want a degree apprenticeship instead? You know, if they know what the steps are, then there's no nasty surprises along the way. Mm. We had a, a member whose daughter wanted to do physics at university and hadn't realized that she was gonna not be able to get straight onto the course because she'd not done a maths A level as well. She did physics A level, but in order to do a physics degree, you need math A level and physics A level. So she's going to have to do a foundational year, which is going to cost her a year of her life. It's at uni, so it's not the end of the world. But still, if she'd done the research beforehand, she'd have saved herself that stress. So it's even if your child thinks they know what they want to do, planning ahead for it, getting some work experience for it as well, because that can make a huge difference as to whether you can get in to what you need. So we start with helping them figure out what's in it for them. You know, what am I working towards? What is, what is the prize at the end of all this for me? And then we give them all the tools. So we talk them through creating a great plan. We give them checklists for every single subject by exam board. So they can not only make sure they cover everything, but they can track what they've done as they go. Because the amount of content to cover is, is overwhelming. It, it, there's no getting around that. But uh, if they're ticking, off, ticking stuff off as they go, like, I've done that. I've learned that. Oh, I'm happy with that one. That one's green. Cross it out. This one I'm still questionable on. So I'm going to leave it in amber. Um, they can see their workload reducing because they've ticked things off. There's now less to do. Mm -hmm. And so being able to tick things mm -hmm. off is, is a really powerful motivator. So the checklists really, really help. Um, we then have uh, lessons on study skills and we, we've got cheat sheets for maths, English and science where we've 
brought together all the really great links to the websites, usually made by teachers, where if there's a topic that your kid doesn't quite understand, um, then I always say it's like a jigsaw puzzle piece. If I'm trying to explain something to you and it's not going in, it's like me trying to put in a jigsaw puzzle piece the wrong way up. I have to explain it differently, like turning the jigsaw puzzle piece around until it will fit in your brain. Mm. And if their teacher only explains it one way and they don't understand it, that's not their fault. That's the teacher's fault. Yep. And they need to find someone who explains it differently. And that's something that works as an adult as well. If I'm trying to work out why my email won't do what I want it to and Google something and that makes no sense, I'll go to another link on Google until I can figure it out. So that kind of learning how to learn and, and figuring that stuff out, that can make a really big difference too. And then we've put in all sorts of useful bonuses, things like guide to choosing a university, because mm. that's the next step that you're gonna have to start thinking about. And um, we've got an exam timetable generator, because if they're in year 11, the exam timetable is out now, but like this is currently March as we speak. The exam timetable's been out since January. So you can have that actual timetable for the summer on the fridge, helping to focus their mind and stop them from that wait until Easter and then actually do something. And, and that can be massively powerful too. So kind of talking them through all of those things and then a bit of troubleshooting as well, the common things that go wrong, the common problems that students face and how to overcome them. Mm. Because otherwise you feel like it's just you. Like, but I'm getting really overwhelmed about this and I don't know where to start. Well, here's how you fix yeah. that. And, and again, everyone else is getting overwhelmed as well. So don't worry about that. And that's what I say yeah. when I go into the schools, like I'm talking about the mental health with the kids. I'd be like, do you mean that here are these common problems that every single human being has? So if you've experienced any one of these, congratulations, you're human, you're not alone. But something that you, you mentioned there, which was absolutely profound, and I was just having a bit of a moment then. Um, well, two things. First of all, you started talking about something. I can't remember what it was. Uh, I think it was the first thing about getting organized. Uh, I, I then had a flashback of when I was outside my exam and I had a scrunched up piece of paper where I wrote all my notes. It's honestly about a post-it note, like a, a, a little uh, note side. And I just remember looking at it, like somehow I was going to pass this exam by quickly revising five minutes before I was about to enter. So that was the first thing that popped into my head. And the second thing was, um, that was absolutely nuts what you said about uh, looking at the house that you want to live in. That was really profound for me. That's a, that for, visually for kids to be mm. like, well, what again? So I talk about like what kind of job do you want to have and to work it back that way, like it's reverse engineering it. But mm. actually having that house, that's a great idea. Visually having, well, what kind of house do you want to live in? Okay, well, this how much is wow, cost that much? Yeah, it does. Okay, so now you know this how much you've got to earn. Cool, what kind of jobs pay that? Again, what well, you have to, and you basically reverse engineer it so they actually understand you're not doing this exam to get a grade, you're doing this exam to get that house in the future. That was nuts. And when you explain that, really, like, because that's what I did, got vision boards. So he said about me in 10 years. I know I'm going to be in 10 years. I don't know exactly how I'm going to get there, but I know the life I'm going to have. I've, I've got a vision board, I've got audio of me talking to myself where I'm going to live. But I've never thought about doing that with a kid in the sense of, just actually, where, what kind of house do you want to have? What, how much money will that cost? And then you go, you would literally reverse engineer it from there. That is genius. Yeah, and we we touch very lightly on the idea of, of bills and tax and that kind of stuff as well. Brilliant. Um, I mean, one of the things we do in the membership, we did it in the, uh, when they first cancelled exams, we're like, well, what do we do now for our members? We can't talk them through how to help your child pass their exam. They're not doing one. So we did adulting skills. So we did uh, personal finance stuff. Credit cards, how do they work? Oh. Credit score, how does that work? Because you don't get that until you're an adult. And you well, try it, well, even, well, even and then, start. even then you don't even know. You don't even no. know. And payday loans, which is something that's really dangerous. And if you don't understand how it works, it's compound interest again, but you don't get to teach that stuff. I, 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 had a, time. I had a client that just came to me and said that he took out a £200 payday loan when he was 18 and he ended up having to pay £4,000 back because mm -hmm. he literally kept taking more payday loans out to pay off this 200 yeah. pounds and it compounded. Mm -hmm. it, may, it, may, it may actually be nearly eight, eight grand. It might have been four, but either way, mm -hmm. it was a substantial amount of money for 200 pounds. No. It was one of the best videos you ever watch if, if, yeah. if it's a, a young lad or lass watching this, watching these videos mm -hmm. about payday loans, it, it, it makes yeah. it very clear what they're about who the winners are and who the loser is always going to be. Yeah. Um, we, we also did a thing about uh, salaries and savings. Yeah. And we worked out, uh, this is a slightly depressing thing we did, we worked out how much we'd earned over the last 10, 15 years or so between us. And, you know, we've, we've teachers with good salary jobs and what have you, and we literally saved not a penny. 
And uh, But if we'd actually put away five, 10% or whatever, which we could easily have done without really impacting our lifestyle, yeah. we could have paid a house off. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And and we haven't done that because we were just enjoying ourselves. We didn't think about it. And no, and no one tells you, no one tells you. Yeah. And so so it's funny if you said this, like, um, again, obviously when this goes out, it'll be on Tuesday, but tonight on the Friday, uh, I had an old uh, podcast guest uh, called um, uh, Chris Felton, who basically talks about how to get people out of debt. And I had to spend a lot of money learning how to get out of debt. And basically all this information, I was like, wow, why did no one tell you this? Like when you, when the money comes in, automatically split it off, put 5% here, do this, do that. But, but no one tells you, literally not a single person tells you. So you literally spend your entire life getting money and spending it before you've even earned it. And it baffles me and blows my mind. And my mum kind of fell out of me over this because she's like, oh, well, we told you about money. I said, no, 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 you told me to, to spend less than I earn. And I said, fundamentally, yes, that is correct. But I was like, you didn't teach me about inflation or interest rates or this or that. She went, well, I didn't know about that. I said, yeah, I know you didn't. That's the problem. It's not your fault, but because you didn't know, I didn't know. And I've struggled and got myself into debt. And what well, I did, I managed to get myself out of it. But it's such a bizarre thing that we're just not taught that. So I'm so glad that you guys are taking this holistic approach. It's not just the exams. It's like, okay, well, yeah, you've got the exams, but actually adulting, here's the things that I wish that I knew. Just, just watch this. Yeah, um, and, it's, um, and it's come from our boys. I mean, they're in their second year at uni at the moment. So they've gone off to do the, like, the adulting stuff on their own. And they're not quite out in the real world yet, but they're pretty close. Mm -hmm. And so it's all the stuff that, you know, we know they need to know because they're now in charge of their own budgeting and, and stuff like that. And it's something that you, know, you go from worrying about their exams to then they get in sixth form and, and you start to see that kind of university or jobs or whatever looming and you're thinking oh my goodness they're nearly adults mm -hmm. like they're, they're going to be on their own they're not ready for this <laughs> they can't even cook a big beans on toast this is just... so you know figuring out that stuff is that, is, that your, is that your next thing, Paul? You're going to get on a nice apron and start doing some cooking lessons. Is that going to be your next video? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm pretty good at the old uh, cooking side of things. But, and, and the boys, you know, to be yeah. fair, yeah. They, they have taken it on. They are, you know, when, when you talk to them now, it's like, I've just, uh, I've got to go to the Lidl. I've got to go to Aldi to get my food. Oh, I love Whereas, it. you know, that was not part of their kind of no. orbit before they left home. They just thought, well, food comes from... Uh, the Tesco, Sainsbury's, yeah. or, or, or Waitrose, or occasions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, whereas now it's like, <laughs> go, not going to Tesco, it's not going to Sainsbury's. Well, well, again, save, save, again, you see, yeah, exactly, save money. And that's the biggest thing. That no, again, yeah. no one tells you. I try and get all my clients go to Aldi. And again, I literally give my clients a cheat sheet for Aldi because people don't know how to work Aldi and they say, oh, it's a nightmare. I'm like, have a list and do not deviate from that list. Do not go down the middle aisle. You, 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 slowly, you slowly walk up and down and you look left and you look right. And if nothing's there, you just keep walking and you navigate it around. By the end of it, you'll have what you need and it's fine. And eventually you'll learn the layout of the store and you'll be fine. I said, yeah. just avoid the middle aisle and don't go in there with any expectation of, I know where this is going to be. And you're fine. And you end up saving 50 pounds on your, your shopping. So big shout out to Aldi. Aldi, if you want to um, sponsor the podcast, give, give me a shout. Yeah, <laughs> um, so, and, so, and with the 50 pounds you save, you can go down the middle aisle next time and you can buy yourself a nail gun, which is what I nearly did last time. And, and, and a nail gun, a fire pit, like the things they've got there is just ridiculous, like a barbecue, just things you never knew you wanted or needed. And you're like, oh, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> um, so to finally wrap this up then, uh, it's a question I normally ask all my guests, uh, but again, I sort of tailored it specifically to this. Um, again, I was going to do one for students and parents but i think uh, given what we've spoken about i think one of the biggest things is for students so um what's one bit of advice that you would give to a student who feels a bit stuck and out of control with their studying now coming up to their gcses little and often start immediately it doesn't need to be half an hour it doesn't need to be 20 minutes if it's five minutes and you get past that five minutes and you, you're still alive you're still going then you can carry on but don't don't just keep putting it off would be the first first bit of advice i think yeah I love that. definitely um, do you have anything else on that, emily uh, i would say take charge of it mm. like if you feel like you don't know how to learn go out and find out actively you know, google learning how to learn google revision skills and mm. um, be proactive mm. in this because this is not the only thing you're ever going to have to learn mm. and the better you get at learning the further ahead of everyone else you're going to be because if you are the person in your job who learns the new system the fastest, who's going to get promoted first? If, uh, you know, there's, there's so much power in being 
a super learner and it's not actually difficult mm. anyone can learn how to do it so be proactive with it because this is a life skill it's not just about passing your exams this is about making everything you do easier mm. so uh so yeah honestly honestly so can Paul Karen. I was going to say and nag your parents to get the GCSE toolkit and <laughs> If it doesn't work, this is not hard sale. If it doesn't work, we'll give you money back. It's you know, yeah. Some, some for some kids it doesn't work. You know, they, they just don't want to engage. But if it doesn't, that's fine. We'll give you money back. It's there's no no issues. It's uh, we, we back what we do, and uh, yeah. none of this. It's got to be terms and conditions. No, if it just be honest. If it hasn't worked for your yeah. child, we'll, yeah. we'll we'll refund it. No, I love that. Listen, the information you've given today has been generally amazing. Again, I, I don't have a kid, but for me, this has really helped me understand some stuff. Again, as I said, I've literally was having flashbacks while you were talking. Um, but where can people find out more about you? Again, Mikey's going to uh, put the links all across the bottom of the screen. Um, so what's the website and where's the best place for people to get in contact with you? Is it like an Instagram or something? Or We're parentguidetogcse.com or if you've got older kids, parentguidetopost16.com with the numbers 16. Um, Facebook is probably the best place to find us. So if you search that in facebook we've got the page but we've also got a group so we talked earlier about there not being a community available for for parents of teenagers there is one it's ours we've built it come along ask your questions it doesn't have to be academic stuff everyone's in the same boat as you are and um, we are also on instagram and um, at parent guide to gcse so uh, come find us anywhere ping us an email anytime and um, we are here to help, so just yeah. shout. We love jumping on and having uh, quick chats with mm -hmm. uh, either members or people who aren't members but need a bit of help. We will give time up to speak to anyone. Love it. Honestly, honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to both of you guys. Thank you very much for, for coming on and actually sharing all this information. It's been absolutely incredible. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Take care. See ya.